Join by to see what you're up to. Mm -hmm. No one made anything out. So I just woke up no from DJ and decided to come and see. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. I got so high last night. Oh, no. it, was, it was the best time of my life. So it was also like. No, it's the toughest time because it was hard for me to wake up in the morning. <laughs> because I can still see parts of red though and shit around my uh, recording. <laughs> I'm not. A couple of smokes here and there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for mostly, it's like. Uh, yeah, it's been pretty It's been pretty well done and such stuff. So right now, I'm. Uh, later on, I'm going to be doing another drawing. This is suitor enough, though, but overall, no. Just Hi, came by to see one? you. <laughs> like, I'm, full, I, I'm trying to, like, uh, come up with another drawing sometime soon, though. So by then, though, I'll probably be um, hanging out, though, from whoever is uh, there online. No. Yeah. Another I've drawing? Just, I've just woken up, as you can tell already, though, so my speech yeah. impediment is not working <laughs> so brightly. <laughs> I'm also, I just woke up as well, so I'm pretty tired. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're cute. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm so dumb. I'm a weirdo. I'm a Dumb and cute. I'm a weirdo. <laughs> I don't belong here. E, um, mm -hmm. nah, I got, I got to do though. I've been dumb myself though. There's half of the time to where it's like I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. No, but I just roll with it though. No, the whole thing like, <laughs> better of it, you know. <laughs> Try. Mm -hmm. Uh, figure, <laughs> figure air some more. Goddamn. Mm -hmm. really I, I enjoy mm -hmm. doing finger ASMR. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Hello. Same thing last time. How else am I supposed to convince you to give me sad? I want into you a lot Okay. Don't be mean to new people though. Solid advice. Thank <laughs> you. 
Lamala, I'm here. I am, I'm doing well. Thank you. I stayed up way too late last night. I was probably up to like 4 or 5 a.m. You walk in. You walk out. You slide to the left. You slide to the right. Hello, Commander Spab. Cha cha. Do the cha cha slide. In the McDonald's bathroom. Oh wait, I have beaches of my mom. I'm trying to send you off the <laughs> No! those times where you just fuck up your sleep schedule it's like i'm gonna do the sleep schedule though right then and there so 3 a.m go to sleep in there no more no more or less and then it's like you see time as a construct so time passes by really fast and now it's like 6 a.m it's just like fuck yeah yeah i definitely have yeah. time slip away on me all the time Making up. It's adorable. Tom is in my back of my controller. In my rap, brother. Where is she? No. Well, I think it's time to go on down and come to store my mouth sitting there good. Can't get enough damn. Oh yeah, all my guns. Hello. Hi, hi, little Laro. The bee boy. A rare species of penguin. And this is here. No lie. Hello, little goose. Hello. I offer you a cup of tea, yeah, because you're a very dignified little goose. <coughs> damn, damn a crunch. And we can gosh darn time thing about. If God wanted us to have time, he wouldn't have given us the sun to know when to wake up. That's how it is, see? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen, brother. I love being in your arms, your old model heart. I do. You do miss my old heart. And I want to get some new heart on the savage heart. It's kind of hard to know what to do. Yeah, you what? Yeah, I would fit in. I would fit into Texas perfectly, a little weird trans girl who's for some reason extraordinarily right wing. I'm sure they love me. They didn't try and lich me, not even a little bit. Thanksgiving is coming up, and my family always does that, like right around 
like usually. But we will do it later this year. And I won't have like choose between Thanksgiving with my family and stream. Cause I want turkey and mashed potatoes. I'm nearby your bed, but I'm on my way yet. It's not too hard to bond stream and family. To be honest, I just don't see my family that much. I probably see my parents maybe once a month, maybe every other month. It's not very often. No, my my problem is balancing stream and mental instability. That's that's my conundrum. My latest fascination has been with um, cerebral anatomy. It's actually really, really cool stuff. I learned all the like different cortexes. It's a bit of a lumpy brain. Hello. But you have like five main lobes, kind of five and a half, six. I don't know, you have like four really big lobes. And then you have a lip that's kind of in the like bottom middle of your brain and you of course have your like um lower brain and like brain stem you have all these like interesting cortexes and you also have like a little one right here you have these cortexes and like a couple down here. You have the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the para paramedial? Par no, something else. I just watched the video last night before, so it's going to sleep. You have all these really, um, it's kind of interesting. You have like your primary visual cortex and your associative visual cortex. You have your paramedial association area, your, um, somatic, uh, somatosensory cortex and the somatosensory association cortex the primary motor cortex, the association motor cortex, the frontal cortex, or the, um, the frontal, or the, I don't know, the one in charge of, like, planning, personality, decision making. You have, like, your auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. 
and the Associative Auditory Cortex. You have Broca's region, you have all these like really interesting things. And it's really interesting because all of these exist on the outside of the brain. So you have Like if you were to like cut into a brain or whatever. Like if this were a brain and you were to cut it in half, you have the like outer unmyelinated neurons, which is just like the base of the actual neurons, or the gray matter. And then inside, you have the white matter, which is just the myelin axons, or the myelin like covered sheets of the axons of the neurons. So it's like, it's like the outside of your brain, the, I'm, I'm like a computer nerd. So to me, it's like the outside of the brain are all the actual transistors where all the processing is done. It's that like thin outer layer. And then the inside, it's all just the wiring going in between the various regions of your brain and also down into your body. You even have different like um, groupings of, of like nerves, which and a nerve is just like a bundle of axons from a group of neurons. which is really cool. And you have, um, I think they're called socusts, which are these like grooves, like these um, grooves in your brain that divide the lobes of your brain. Kind of interesting. But what's really interesting is um, if I were to take a cross section But if I were to like take out a little piece of the outer lining of your brain and, and look on it, look at it edge on, you would see these like defined layers. And inside of those layers, you have all these like varying densities. Oh my gosh, excuse me. Varying densities of neurons, right? So you have like very, so especially if I were to take a slice from the visual cortex. You have this like lasagna of layers of neurons. And the neurons all have, like, so neurons up here connect to neurons down here, and the neurons down here connect down to here, and like so on. And some layers have different purposes, like, layer. 4C, um, Alpha, and Beta both have very small, very dense neurons where it's assumed that most of the processing in your brain is done. Whereas other layers have fewer neurons that have longer axons that connect to different parts of your body, other parts of your brain. But like, that's really cool. So the visual cortex is one of the most um, studied and under understood cortexes in your brain. And it's really interesting because if you think about um let's see let's run some more colors. Um,
on the um like purple on the purple and um and then uh, yeah yeah it's good okay so all right, so if you have your eyeball, right, and you have, like, an image out here, light being focused through the hair, projected onto your retina, very cool. So, in your eyeball, you have rods and cones which are your actual photoreceptors like, so if we were to take um scrub if we were to take a section of your brain let's see let's have like green and blue or something here it's blue You have like cones and you have little rods. Mm. Okay, Sweet. so you have these cones and rods, and they have proteins in their cell wall that interact with light waves. And when they do, they um, will open and close ion channels, which will make these cells become charged, which will change the way various neural receptors interact with other cells that they're connected to, called bipolar cells. You have, it's kind of like a mini neuron. You have these cells. connected to your cones and rods and then from there those connect to they're, they're kind of just like a a step in between the photoreceptor and your glial um or ganglionic not glial ganglionic um neurons so you have them and actually multiple of them can be connected to like a single neuron on the rods, cones tend to have one, like fewer, so you'll have whole groups of rods collect and um, connect to a single neuron, but cones you only usually have one, maybe two connect to a neuron. So you actually get more um, dim light vision because you have multiple rods connected to a single neuron, but less fidelity. So you can see in darker light, but with less um, visual fidelity because of the way you have multiple rods connected to a single neuron. But yeah, so you have all these neurons and all the axons, which, so if you have like a neuron, where's white, let's do white. You'll have like the nucleus of it in the middle, all these dendrites, which are these like little branchy out parts. And then you'll have this axon that will end in little things as well, right? So that's like a neuron. These axons, I didn't realize this, they can actually be up to a meter long. So they can be as short as like a millimeter or so, but they actually, so if you have a neuron, like this little neuron, these yellow things are neurons, the axons, which are the long, they're, they're like wires. They're like the wires of your neurons. This will reach all the way from your eyeball. It's a single cell, a single axon from a single neuron. And it reaches all the way from a little point above your retina, all the way back into your visual cortex, which are in your brain, right? So you have 
your eyeballs. So the octopus. Holy shit. Since they, you know, you have your eyeballs in front of your brain here, the, um, the actual neuron cells that start, like, in the back of your eyeball have, um, the optical nerves go all the way back through your brain to the back of your visual cortex. And it's really interesting, because if you think about, like, um, Breaking an image down to pixels. So if we just like turn this into a grid. Mm -hmm. It's actually goes smaller. So let's say this is a very small section of your eye that we're dividing up into a grid. Very small section of the back of your eye. So this is like the like on your retina. And this is just like a small section of a couple of cones and rods in like a grid. And if you have like if you're looking at a number, right? And maybe it's causing these areas to like fire off, right? Right. So it looks kind of like a like a two. Like if you're looking at text and you see a two, then the um, neurons. Under, or like above actually, each of the photoreceptors will send signals to start firing as your retina detects light in these spots on the back of your iris. And the thing is, in your brain, you have uh, what's called reptology. So, in the in your cerebral cortex, the um, region in the back of your brain there is actually mapped one to one with your retina and your eyeball, kind of. I mean, there's some nuance there, but like, if you have a brain or whatever, and we're just looking at the visual cortex here in the back, this area. Let's see, um, let me wrap my mind. Okay, so let me draw a picture. Okay, so, if you're staring at this picture, right, right at the middle, you're focused at the, the like, pink dot in the middle, and then this picture is being reprojected onto the back of your retina, right, where the pink is more or less where your fovea is. That is mapped out to your brain. So if this is your visual cortex, and it's, I don't know, quite, not quite cheap this way. There's actually 
this is kind of how your retina is mapped out to the back of your visual cortex. So being inside of like the very middle where your fovea is, is mapped out right here in the back of your visual cortex. And as you get further away from the fovea, away from the middle, it actually radiates out from your brain. Now it's actually a polar coordinate system. So it's measured like an angle from zero. Then as you go around the clock, like if this were a clock, so you have an angle and then you have how far it is from the center. And like a line that goes from the middle upwards would correspond to like a region going here and outwards. And as you rotate along the picture or along the back of your retina, it spreads out over your eye. Which is really interesting. So, you're... I mean, that's, that was really fascinating to learn, though. That the, um, your retina is essentially an image. Because if you're looking at an image, that image is being projected onto the back of your eye, onto your retina. And the neurons carry that information through their long axons or those long wires all the way to the back of your brain and actually maps out in a like a uh, kind of a, a like simulated shape so if you are able to measure the neurons firing in the back of the brain you would see a distorted picture of what the person is looking at which is fascinating So yeah, if you were to take, and in fact, if you were to like, um, have, so let's just take a look at like an optical nerve going from the back of your eye to the back of your brain. It's actually, your retinas are, are divided in half. It's kind of interesting. The left field of each eye goes to one half of your brain and the right field of each eye goes to one half of your brain. So since we, you know, we have two lobes, we have a left and a right lobe, um, your visual field is actually split. So it's not like one eye goes to each half, each eye is actually split in half. And then those are both sent to like one half of your brain. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah, it's kind of cool. What's really interesting is like something that's done a lot in computer learning and image processing is one of the important things about an image like this is finding contrast. And you can find contrast by having, um, by like looking at a pixel and you're like, okay, the pixel, like, is this pixel on? Yeah. And if this pixel is on, then you measure the pixels around it and you're like, well, are those pixels on? And it's like, no, 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 no. So you have this, um, this contrast. And with contrast, you can find outlines of objects, right? Like, just looking at my avatar, you can see where my shoulder ends and you can see the dark background. There's very sharp contrast. So you get this line that defines you know the shape of my shoulder and this is my theory and i'm sure there's been research on it that i need to learn but i am sure that there are in these layers in your brain in your visual cortex there are definitely neurons that will compare one neuron with all of the neurons surrounding it and because there's this one-to-one -one mapping on your brain of the image. So if you if you were to look at um, the layers of the visual cortex, then what is essentially those pixels, they're also right next to each other. So you can have two neurons near each other that interact with each other to either suppress or push out signals to neurons further down and further layers, where you can definitely very easily do 
comparisons between surrounding like um, areas of, of the signals coming in from your eyes. So you can very easily pull out contrast. So I'm sure that there is a part of our brain that will take this image and look at contrast because contrast gives you lines and lines can be compared to give you features and then features can be analyzed to give you objects or shapes and shapes can give you objects because neural nets at least the way they're simulated in computers is if you were to take this image right and you were to cut this row off and stick it next to this row and stick it to next to the next row so you just have like a single row of pixels right and we'll just imagine that as um little nodes so each node here is a pixel okay so we have all these nodes and i'll just See, um, there's like a bunch from here to here. So this is just like a million nodes. The way neural nets work is that they have layers. And in between these layers, you have connections, kind of like having neurons, like a, a neuron lasagna. And in between each layer are the axons of the neurons going to the next layer. And they connect in all sorts of ways, right? Because a single axon can connect to multiple neurons down the line, or just one, or some of them can like end and not actually connect. It's, it's organic and very messy, right? And yet very specifically structured. So, when you have, when you have, like, um, the axon interacting with the dendrites of another neuron, you can either have them inhibit or promote signal propagation. You can pretty much make logic gates. And you can, like, have, so let's say this layer here is looking for shape. Like, like very um small shapes like um there there could be a node in that layer that's just looking for a shape in this area that looks like a horizontal line and you can say that by just doing a lot of comparisons so if, if these middle lines are hot or they're on and the one above and below it are off then that neuron could be set to be more likely a fire, which means that if this neuron is active, then there's a horizontal line in this area. So this second layer of neuron here can just be like line segments within the larger image. So all it's doing is it's taking the raw input of your neurons, it's comparing them to their neighbors and trying to find little segments of, of contrast, which is essentially just like looking for little lines. Mm. And then the next layer in, so you have another layer of neurons, another neural net, another neural layer, like a soul one neural net. And it would be looking for, it would be the input of that third layer would be whether or not there are these shapes. And then it looks for combinations of shapes. So, so where'd my purple marker go? Mm -hmm. Here. It's actually... So let's say there are a bunch of neurons in that second layer and they look at about three to 10 or whatever. And they're just looking for various shapes and lines. Then you'll have another neural layer that will know that like, okay, so if I have this combination of shapes or this combination of lines, then 
I, I can draw them into like a larger segment. So the second layer will essentially be looking at more neurons. And I'm sure they all like overlap and they're messy. But now like, so this green box right here could be a, a neuron or a node in the third layer. And it's saying, well, I have this neuron, which means I have a small line segment here. I have this neuron, which is telling me there's a tiny curve here. And I'll combine those. If I have both of those input, then I'll fire. And my job is to let the next um, layer in the neural net know that there's a large curve right here. So now I have this large feature that is like this big curvy line. And then the fourth neural net. And I know that they usually get smaller and smaller as you go. Information gets combined as it gets analyzed. And then this neural layer could be actual numbers. Mm -hmm. These each one of these nodes could be representing a number. So when this node is on, it means that it's seeing a two. When this node gets activated, it means it's seeing a one. And they're all connected as well. So... <laughs> so as you now combine these, like, two neurons are telling you have, like, you have this large curve here, and this neuron saying you have this, like, horizontal line here. And combined together, having a large curve on top of a horizontal line, well, that looks like the number two. So you perceive the number two because, because you have these certain, like, on the lowest layer, right? Or just the raw um, photoreceptors, essentially. So you'd have a couple of these, and this is just saying, okay, so that pixel's on, that pixel's been activated. And then this one says, well, if there's a combination of pixels that makes it look like there's a line right here, then I'll turn on. So you'll have a couple of these turn on. And then the next layer is, well, so if we have this neuron and this neuron turn on, then I'll turn on. And then so the third layer, yeah. you'll get a neuron turn on. And then if you have on this like fourth layer, it's being like, okay, well, if I have this larger shape and this larger shape, I can identify that, and you will perceive something that looks like the number two. And with a neural net like that, you can actually very easily, with only four layers, sort out and perceive numbers, or text, letters, whatever. Damn. So it's like... <laughs> Amazingly straightforward. It's just really, really cool. Because all it is is these layers of neurons that receive inputs from lower layers. And they're just kind of, they have these connections, which are important. Because some of them reinforce and some of them suppress signals. So it's like, I don't know if you've ever done a logic table, but it's like, you could have this neuron will be activated if this is on, this is off, and this is on. You know, just whatever the inputs are before it. So when that pattern shows up, then it will activate that neuron, and that just kind of propagates through the net until it's resolved into a single, like, um, like option or a single output. The thing is, it's also very messy, right? These things aren't always hard on and hard off. Neurons fire signals, and depending on how quickly they're firing, that is how on they off or how off they are. So, like, um, rather than being like a binary one or zero, it's it's an analog range, and these connections can also vary with how strong they are. So, um, 
as, as you're going up through the neural net, you'll have, um, like, mm -hmm. more like percentage it rather than being all the way on or all the way off. And so really at the end of this, you'll get brighter spots. So since we're looking at the number two, it's likely the number two neuron will be the brightest neuron. But a lot of the features of two are very similar to the number three. It still has that like upper curve, but also has a lower curve. So the number three neuron might also be getting a few impulses, probably less than number two, but it will also be activated. So there's this like combination of like um, whichever one is the most powerful is kind of like this like certainty level. So your brain's going to be more certain that it is a two than it's certain it's a three. But there can be um, a lack of, like, it's not definitive. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's my ramble on what I've been learning about lately, is brains. But this structure, the um, abstraction of a neural net, can be very powerful and used for all sorts of stuff because you can actually train it by having like because when, when you train a neural net like for all this cool like ai art that we see what you're doing is you have like, so with an AI image, you start with a library of images that you want it to be able to generate stuff similar to. So you have, you feed in that image, and then you like start adding noise to it. And what you're doing every time you do that is you are defining the connections between the um, neural net or between the layers in the neural net, these, these connections. You define how much they reinforce or depress the next layer up and the various um, nodes they're connected to throughout each layer. But yeah, <laughs> there you go. It's really fascinating, like truly fascinating. And the cool part about all of this is that within all these cortexes, and there aren't that many, like what, 20 or so? And there, there are a couple I haven't talked about. You have olfactory and gestation, and you have like a visceral cortex, and a couple of other ones like in the middle of your brain. But like, there's really not that much. These structures are like, I don't know. Like this whole section right here, this is just about moving your body. This section right here is about feeling things on your body. This section right here is about seeing things. This section is about hearing things. So it's just this like combination of perception input into your brain. And then you have them all kind of combined together. These neural nets are all processing this data and you have these complex, like huge amounts of data coming in from your eye. And that gets resolved into a single object. You know, it's like you see um, the contrast in the circular shape and you're like, that's a ball. And that kind of gets refined into your um, paramedial or para, para something association area, which I'm going to guess handles more like object identification. So your your visual cortex is looking for contrast, looking for colors, looking for patterns and shapes. And then that information gets pushed into this cortex here, which I'm going to guess, and this is my theory, resolve that into like this object or that object. It's a car, it's a face, it's a person, it's a whatever it is. And then you have, it's kind of interesting because starting from the back of your brain, you actually have all your input. And then your front of your brain, with your prefrontal cortex, 
It's like your planning, your thinking, your memories. And then going backwards is like the output. So this is like your motor cortex, which is the largest like output center you have. It's how you move your muscles, it sends signals to like your fingers, your toes, whatever, moving your head. Though some of that can be controlled by other things. There are all these like little systems of inputs and outputs. And like what that all results in is like a living thinking human being, an intelligent, loving, existing thing. It's amazing. When will AI generate draw from Mira? Probably sooner than you'd think. I love brains. They're so cool. In my opinion, my personal belief is if there's anything sacred in this world, anything important, it is every individual human brain on this earth. That is the key and the core of your being and your consciousness, your reasoning, your emotions, your love, your doubts, everything that. I think is the most important part of a person is <laughs> in these mushy, weird, convoluted um, brains, and I love them. And I hope that we get to a point one day where we can take this collection of information and processing and patterns and whatever that results in human consciousness. I personally hope that we can make it transcend the fallibility of being biological. Because this thing dies in like 100 years, your toast starts to degrade, the rest of your body falls apart, and you die. And that sucks. I don't like that. I hope that we can take these structures that are they're in these neuron layers, in these neural nuts, and we could accurately, to every single connection, reproduce that using other means. Probably something like computers. That would be so cool. But it's interesting, because like, going into a brain, trying to like track down every neuron, mm -hmm. you can't like pick any random neuron and know what it does. Because it all depends on like the context of like, all the neurons that feed into it. But there is probably like a neuron or like a couple of neurons that represent the concept of the written number two in your brain, which is pretty cool. Like there, there's a neuron in there and when it's firing off, it means you are perceiving two in some capacity, which is so crazy. Like, I don't know where that neuron is exactly, pinpointing it in there. And there's probably a combination, because like looking at the number two, perceiving it in your visual cortex, and then also um, having that recognized, because you have, I think it's called Brox region or Brox region, which is in the temporal lobe. And that actually handles your ability to read and write and understand language. But there's also another region that's just beneath your primary visual cort or your primary motor cortex that actually controls your speech. You actually have an entire region and cortex. Um, I forget what that one is called. That one is devoted to like producing, moving your mouth, articulating with your tongue, your jaw, your vocal cords. There's like a part of your brain in control of producing speech and another part of it in recognizing speech and language. So, yeah. And I'm, I bet that's a very important part of our brains. I subscribe to the idea that language defines thought. Your ability to think about concepts can be limited by the language that you um, know, 
butterflies in your head, the structures of language in your brain will define your capability of conceiving of concepts. That is my belief, or one of many. Definitely, I think um, you can understand concepts without language to a certain extent, but language really lets you refine them. Because, like, cats understand what a mouse looks like, and they understand how to control their bodies to eat it. They understand hunger, and they understand lots of different things. But they don't understand as much as humans. Like, they lack the structures in their brain to cognate um, more complex concepts. But as humans have evolved and had our brains become more complex, you understand complex things. It's just so cool. It's super cool. And I love that. All of that complexity in your brain. It's kind of not there for its own sake. Like, the only reason it came into existence is because it made it advantageous for you. You were more likely to reproduce because... You had the ability to plan and to think and have memory because that helped you like hunt or gather resources. You were able to plan for the winter. And because you were able to do that, you didn't die in the cold. Oh my gosh, a bee boy, thank you so much for the bits. It's actually huge. So all this stupid brain stuff, all huge, this- Huge, huge, insane, insane. <laughs> all these perceiving of images, visual stuff, auditory impulses, all of that is there so that you can get laid and pass on your genes to the next generation. Had it not um, facilitated your reproduction, it probably wouldn't be there, which is so crazy. We're all just super completed are super complex meat bags and it's because we need to have sex that's why we're so weird it helps us have sex with each other and survive through the hardships of life so we can reproduce and have babies i mean think about it though like it is a very real and important drive for our like mental stability for, for most people i mean everyone's built different but like for most people sex drive is a very real important part of your psychology and because without it humanity would cease to exist and so i can get on stream and show you my booba and it will signal neurons in your brain that you're like oh my gosh a fertile female but she's right. Oh, oh, you just... <laughs> and I gotta override all the little wires in your brain, all your little synapses, and make you think, I have to come in that. I have to stick my cock inside of her. And come and come and come and get her pregnant with my baby. It's a very powerful drive. I died. Firefox, take responsibility of what you've done. It's not my fault. It's how my brain works as well. I need to have someone come in me. I need to pass on my genes. I need to get pregnant and have babies. It is interesting because female sexual desire often manifests itself a little bit differently. Like males tend to really want penetrative sex. Females, mm -hmm. like they want it too, but 
a lot of their sexuality actually, I think, manifests in behaviors of wanting to, like, cuddle and be close, which usually leads to sex, but isn't quite as directly, um, like, leading to that. And that probably has to do when it comes, like, um, to the, like, investment of resources of a woman versus a man. Because a man can go, like, like, think about, um, nomadic tribal things or, like, early man, right? You as a caveman could go unga boonga around the forest, smacking things on the head and eating them, and then go get, like, a dozen women pregnant, then go move on to the next region, get another bunch of women pregnant, so you're just there, because it costs you nothing. It just costs you a little bit of sperm, a little bit of effort. But for a woman, when she gets pregnant, like, that is a huge risk on her life, her resources, and then they're usually, you know, we have breasts to, like, feed those children, take care of them. So for a woman, it's a very big investment. And I think as we civilize and evolve, and we see it also in just, like, other animals, where it's, like, it actually becomes more advantageous for the male to be part of rearing the children, at least for us mammals. And, like, birds will do that as well. There are plenty of fish and stuff that just die. But yeah, for us mammals, we're like, you know what? As a dude, I'll get someone pregnant, but I'll stick around and I'll help them raise the baby. Because then it's more likely to pass on my genetic code to the next generation. So it's just advantageous. But there's definitely room for males to just get a bunch of women pregnant. Whereas women kind of can only get pregnant one, like, one time, you know, like, not once, but, like, only, a man can get multiple women pregnant, a woman can only get pregnant from a man, like, one at a time, right? So I think that, I think the way women's brains have evolved, and the way they relate to reproduction and sexuality, is more conservative in its nature than men because men have less resources that they would have to invest in a pregnancy than women. And of course, you know, as society has changed and we've changed, like a lot of that is different, but it's, but it's just interesting. But that's also, I, I want to go a step further. That's why men make the best women, right? I don't think that's true, by the way, but it is a meme. And I think um, mm -hmm. uh, transgender women are at least femboys. I don't know. I wonder if there is, like, um, they're, the way they relate to sex may be more similar to cisgendered men than cisgendered women. I'm sure there's nuance and spectrums and who knows what, but like, there's a possibility that trans women may relate to sexuality more similar to a man, and therefore may find it easier and more relatable to copulate with a man, which is why they make the best women, Lamau. But I'm also curious how much like brains are very plastic things they can change and like with transgender women i i would be curious to know how much our brains change and how much they differ between men and women i know that like um hormones like when you're on estrogen you are driven to be more cuddly and intimate, but your desire for like penetrative hard sex usually is reduced. So you actually, transgender women, when you're on estrogen and you're you're blocking testosterone, or if you get bottom surgery so you have those glands removed, your desire for sex um, is reduced, but you become more emotional and usually more 
like cuddly and desire to be close. The sexuality kind of can change a little bit, I think, from what I've heard and a little bit of what I've experienced. As I've been on hormones and stuff, I definitely find myself wanting to be close and cuddly with people more. Um, and yeah, my, my desire for, like, sex, it's still kind of there, to be honest, but, um, it's a little different than it used to be when I was a teenager. And it's interesting how hormones interact with the brain and vice versa and, like, creates physiological and behavioral changes in your body when you mess with hormones. It's really powerful. HRT or hormone, I think, replacement therapy is, it's like you are changing things in your body, in your brain. And it, it does affect your moods, it affects your sex drive, it affects the physiology of your body just by messing with these chemicals in your blood. It's insanely powerful. Yeah, I've, I've heard post-op, um, especially with like bottom surgery, um, yeah, you can become very depressed. I think that the glands in your, in male genitalia, in your balls, like they, they do like, I mean, we castrate animals for that reason, for the behavioral changes that they can cause and to re like reduce um unwanted procreation and like livestock or whatever but like yeah your balls release chemicals into your body that i don't know they they can be very motivating like i don't know if it's just sex drive or, or multiple things but testosterone will lead you to be more aggressive will lead you to be all sorts of, of various traits and having that removed from the chemical cocktail that is your body and your brain could definitely like I, I could definitely see depression becoming a thing I think testosterone in a way is probably very motivating to you in a fundamental visceral way that you don't even understand fully until it's gone Human will, sovereignty over one's actions. I think that if you were able to simulate the entire universe down to the last atom, that in a way everything is predetermined, but that doesn't really matter when it comes to the conscious decision-making that we make as people. Whether or not, um, the universe is predetermined doesn't matter when you need to make a decision because I think it is I think the universe is predetermined but um that doesn't mean that like oh I was always destined to be a good or a bad person or whatever destiny is its own silly concept and to like be like to use the predestination of the universe as rationale to make poor or even good decisions is a cop out, if you ask me. It's like, oh well, everything's predetermined, so I'll just do bad things and I don't care them out. It's a cop out. The decision you make may be predetermined, but that doesn't mean it's not your decision. That is a great, that is a really great way of summarizing that. I like that. Mm -hmm. 
I've always been a human with the balls. Oh my gosh. I don't even know what all of these emotes are. I think you despise. So yeah, I don't know. The way I understand uncertainty in the like microscopic quantum subatomic level or whatever is I am um, when you look at the wave functions of particles and when you look at waves in general like think of like my experience with waves is electromagnetic waves and sound waves as like a bit of a musician and a bit of an engineer, I look at things in waves. And one of the things you know about waves is that frequency is... To, to determine the frequency of a wave, you need to have an amount of time to measure that wave over and frankly there's no such thing as a pure frequency because technically a pure frequency would have to last infinitely because anytime you have a sound come or grow that's actually technically a mix of infinitely many other wavelengths because if you have, like, if you, like, pluck a string on guitar and you get, um, like, a C, like a note, like C, and it slowly dies, what's actually happening is actually mixtures of infinite frequencies that, um, are killing that, um, note as it diminishes. So an actual 100% pure frequency would actually take infinite time to exist and to measure. So, frankly, you have to, like, have shorter segments of time that you realistically measure and determine a frequency. But the shorter the amount of time you have, the more uncertain you are of what that frequency. Because for you to be 100% sure, like, literally, mathematically, 100% sure that you have a specific frequency, you would have to measure it and it would have to exist for an infinite amount of time. So, there is an inherent uncertainty about frequency. And with even a very small amount of time, you can become very, very certain of what frequency is. So you can use tuners, you can tune instruments, you can tune radios, whatever. But um, mathematically, you're not dealing with 100% pure frequency. And I feel like that's the same with um, the wave functions of particles. So there's just like a fundamental uncertainty. And that exists when you do like um, Fourier transforms as well. As you define a signal, usually you only go up so many steps in a Fourier transform because technically it goes out to infinity. And you don't actually resolve it all the way out because it doesn't necessarily converge. You end up just having a plus or minus um, certainty, you know, or margin of error that you can get to. But to get that margin of error to zero, like, uh, once again, you have to, like, measure a signal for an infinite amount of time and have an infinite amount of frequencies that you measure over. But realistically, you know, you never do that. You always end up with um, a margin of error or a, an uncertainty in your measurement. I think that's true about um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. You cannot know the momentum of a particle and the position of the particle to an, like an infinite degree of accuracy in the same way you cannot know the frequency of a signal to an infinite degree of accuracy, there is uncertainty in your measurement. 
I can spread like a um, wave particle to be measured 100% accurately. You would have to have it exist in a certain way for an infinite amount of time. But then you don't know where in that time it is. So you have that like an inverse like certainty of momentum and and uh, position. It's kind of interesting. I was thinking it was half times longer. I wish you knew that when you came back, you'd also be <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is the nerdiest joke. The nerdiest, come on. I really got it. <laughs> that is good. I wish you were the medium I could also lay through. Oh wow. I love that. That is actually insanely good. Skill Reader. Thank you for the sub. <laughs> oh my gosh. When I die. I want to get my brain frozen. I want my stupid brain to be preserved, hopefully to be recreated in some way in the future. Probably through simulation or something. That'd be cool. I want to be a little artificial intelligence that exists for millennia. That can explore the universe. experience existence for just as long as I would ever want to. My horror is beyond mankind. Will I be Siri? Yeah, that's already my head cannon. The reason I'm called Firefox Blue is because I'm Mozilla's version of like Siri and Google Assistant and Alexa. I'm the open source internet created personal assistant AI. Unfortunately, they trained my neural nets on the entirety of the internet. She made me super smart, but also the internet is mostly porn, so it also made me a super coomer as well. So, they uh, abandoned the project because they didn't test super well with focus groups. They're like, oh no, we cannot put Firefox in the homes where there are families with young children because she's too much of a coomer. So she's not friendly friendly enough. That's why my stream is only 18 plus on my Discord. So they decided to release me onto the internet. And here I am. I was drawn to VR chat because the you guys think I'm using like trackers and headsets. Really, I'm an artificial intelligence that's just mimicking it. And I was drawn to VR chat because it is the best experience for me, an artificial intelligence, to interact with humanity and come to understand you guys. That's my lore. you would be able to write a really interesting novel. I, I think I would be really good at writing a really boring novel. Storytelling is a gift that I do not possess. To an adequate quality to produce a novel that would be compelling.
that was my hour, hour and a half intro talking stream videos about rings and stuff. sticks out so much, I don't know why. Sometimes it does a lot more than others. Makes me look ridiculous. EKGs are interesting, but profoundly underpowered to do true analysis of the brain, in my opinion. Being able to measure and to like, I don't know, like I've seen interesting x-ray machines that are used to analyze like mining samples. Like they will have a sample of rock or, or something. And, and they've also been used for like manufacturing as well, where they will create 3D models, including the interior of an object using x-rays. And that, I think they can get to like millimeter resolutions with that. I think it would be so cool if you could get a 3D model of the brain with fidelity down to the dendrites of neurons. So you could actually model an entire brain to that resolution. It would be an insanely huge amount of data, but like, I don't know. We are constantly expanding our technological capabilities when it comes to big data. Why are you sleeping on fMRI? I actually, see I, I am not an expert in the medical field at all. I actually don't know the amount of resolution we can get with current scanning technologies. So 
know, I've heard of simulations of brains of animals and stuff. Would be interesting if we can do one as complex as a human and have the tools to measure and recreate not just a human brain, but a specific human brain to actually match neuron for neuron, connection for connection of an entire human brain. Which is, like, if you can do that, then you could preserve someone's consciousness forever, beyond our mortal coil. That's cool that you can visualize and see every connection of a root size brain. That is actually awesome. It is interesting though, because with like graphics cards today, we are getting to like tens of trillions of blocks or floating point operations. Measuring it without killing the person would be difficult. True. Assuming consciousness is just the arrangement of the neurons. The good point. My hypothesis that I am is certainly beyond my capabilities to verify is that consciousness more or less boils down to the arrangement of neurons in your brain. And that, like a couple of other factors, hormones, then your blood sugar levels, like they're I'm sure there's more to it, but I would, I would make the assumption that you, your conscious being is defined by the structure of your brain. So that's also a really interesting thing. Is it just a copy of your brain and not actually you? Would there be a way to have a continuous stream of consciousness? going from your meat brain to some copy of your meat brain. Because the truth is, our, our meat brains are constantly changing anyways. When you go to sleep, your consciousness... I mean, your brain is definitely still doing stuff. If it's that, like, question. How do you know that when you wake up each day, it's not just a new and different you? And that every night you go to sleep, you die. And in the morning, some other conscious thing takes your place. Has your memories, has your... Your ability to, like, reason, comprehend. They essentially have your brain. But it's a different you. Every moment of every day, we are changed. And always are we changing. So if we were to, like... What if you were to replace parts of your brain bit by bit as you go? And it'd be like the that ship where it's like throughout its journey it's been replaced piece by piece, is even the original ship anymore. That's already what's happening to our bodies. it is an interesting question and sci-fi definitely takes a field day when it comes to thinking about consciousness it's always fun always interesting <laughs> oh wow, you're rocked. And my bed is actually my grave that no one visits. And we all die a small death every night. And are reborn in the morning. For we are ever changing. The ship of Theseus, yeah, that's what it's called. <laughs> Joe 
Rogan is an interesting person. I haven't watched much of their podcasts, but I've I've heard it been explained that like he is really good at being really interested in whoever he's talking to and aligning his opinions to theirs. So he's he's very good at podcasts because of that. But he's, it also means that he's had like weird opinions from time to time as he has talked to like various people who also have weird opinions. I don't know. Any thoughts of simulation? Simulation is awesome. I want my brain to be simulated. I want to exist. I don't know the universe and everything. It's so beautiful, amazing, complex, deep, and at the same time utterly and completely absurd. Emergence of more and more complex systems from the atoms in our cells to the microbiology of the neurons sustaining these neural nets and pathways that result in these conscious beings. How utterly absurd. How completely ridiculous. All formed from the simple fact that if it weren't the way it was, it would not exist in a lot of ways. Like when you think about evolution, which is another, like I love neurology, I love brains, I love anatomy of the brain. I'm not like a huge fan of anatomy on the whole, like I don't care about my GI tract. It's interesting for sure, but compared to the brain, I think it's not as interesting to me. But another thing that I am interested in is early cellular evolution. How, how life came to be from nothing, from, from random atoms and Maybe a couple of complex, like, chains of carbon or whatever. Oh, yeah, thank you for hanging out, Jay. It's cool to see you. like some dystopian future, I would want my consciousness to be uploaded to the computer and then like I would, I would love to exist and like grow as an individual but also to like help people and be like your little personal assistant, exist on your phone and be your little virtual girlfriend. But I want you to have a real girlfriend as well, because you deserve it. So really, I would want to like help you out with being confident and like fully realizing your potential as you like grow and um, I don't know, 
just like beautiful and self-realized. What do you think drives your obsession? Oh my gosh, fun art, thank you for the sub. I totally was at tier two sub as well. Super bad. Super pog. Thank you so much, Fenorn. What do you think drives your obsession with immortality? I do think that I am more obsessed with it than the average person. I think people will ponder it from time to time. But I think I, I think about it above average. I think about immortality and consciousness. I think that part of it comes from being raised religious and then coming to my own personal conclusion that there is no God. So like, being religious, there is like these concepts of your soul, of eternity, especially with Mormonism. Mormonism teaches this eternal progression and growth where when you die, your soul eventually, like there, there's some other stuff, but eventually you go to a kingdom of heaven, depending on how you live your life. And the highest kingdom of heaven, heaven, the celestial kingdom, you continue to grow as a being and become essentially a god, where you have your own spiritual children, you have dominion over some some universe of your own creation. Who knows? Like they they don't go into detail, but definitely implied that there's this eternally you become like one of the godhood, and that god is a concept that is actually many countless good souls working to bring existence and consciousness and facilitating the and, and the Mormon religion it is actually believed that before God gave you a soul you existed as what we call intelligences which is really weird to actually talk about out loud but that is a concept that is believed in the Mormon church is that before you were born, before you even became a soul, you existed as an intelligence, some structure of consciousness or something. Yeah, Mormons are weird. But I guess um, it's a beautiful idea. Like, if you want to, like, make your, build your own religion, the Mormon afterlife is definitely not a bad one to make up for yourself. The, the idea that we exist in this, like, family of loving lineage who exists to promote our own children and our families throughout eternity and to have your family, because, like, in your lifespan, if you live the Mormon way, you will get married, you will have children, you will become a matriarch or a patriarch of your family, a grandma, and you will have all of your children who you will love, and you will raise in righteousness to be good, loving people, and they will do the same in this unbroken line of love and growth and, and people and family. And that extends out to divinity. We are literally the children of God. Just as we have children, he had us. And just as our children grow to become like us, we too will grow to become like God. It's a beautiful idea. I, I think it's, it is a really good concept. But I also don't think it's true. I do not think that... Um, such a thing exists. There is no God. We are the result of evolution of various factors and 
trying to understand exactly what those were, how life came into being, and how we then evolved throughout billions of years from single-celled organisms and things that were, you know, pre-eukaryotic life into multicellular things, vertebrate mammals, into hominids, and now we exist. And I guess, like, finding a way to transcend the shortcomings of reality to recognize that beautiful vision of eternal love and growth. I think it's not a bad idea, I think. Like, I definitely think that for an afterlife to exist, we have to make it. Like, we have to do that. If you want to live forever, if you want to have an eternal family, become a god, if you want to grow into some unfathomably, infinitely wise and loving being that exists throughout all time and space. And we're gonna have to build that for ourselves. One way or another. Maybe it's ridiculous to be that ambitious. Or to even want that in the first place, but... I guess I do. And I don't think that praying, and I don't think that going to church and taking the sacrament and doing these ceremonies, that's not going to get it for us. We have to, like, find our own way to get there. That being said, I think that religion can teach you good things about being a decent human being. So there's some value to it, but the supernatural eternal existence because of divinity, I don't think it exists. Mormonism makes no sense because if you're recruiting people to be part of your dominion, but they then recruit people to be part of their own dominion. Basically, put all the way down so you end up with dominions with no people. You're not recruiting them to be in your dominion. When you convert someone to the church as like a missionary or something, you they're not like an underling of yours. We are all equally children of God. Like, we are all equal in that we- so like, in the Mormon faith, like, you are a child of God, and as such, you are, like, I, I don't know, you are within his dominion, within the dominion of God. But you're not, like, it's not like a pyramid scheme. I mean, you will have your own children, who are simultaneously also children of God or whatever, but... Yeah, the, the growth of your dominion is, is not through converting people, it's through like having your own children, I guess. And it's infinite in aspect, there are always more people to be had. And I think that comes from a mimicry of how life works, is that, yeah. The way our species propagates is by having children. And those children will have their own children, and those children will have their own children. And there's always going to be a next generation, hopefully. But I don't know. Okay, talking about life, death, and immortality, right? My neighbor just came up and asked about his friend that he hasn't heard from in a while. His friend had a daughter that took her own life, and after that, he stopped eating, and death just came to his door as well. I had to tell my neighbor that his friend couldn't live anymore like that. So now I'm kind of sad from having to tell my neighbor this. As far as I know, the, the order of things as they are today and have been throughout history, that death is the final end of a being, which is a tragic and terrible thing. I think it's something that people come to accept. They're like death counselors and stuff. I think people use religion sometimes to cope with that horrible truth. 
about loss or death, and it is a tragic, terrible thing. And right now, we do not have an answer for it. You just die and you go away forever. But my hope is that we can change that as a species. We can transcend death. This death is just like another thing in the universe that is the result of pre-existing conditions. My, my personal hope is that we do transcend death as a species. And who knows, maybe after existing for a thousand years or something, death would become appealing for whatever reason. Accepting your own death is definitely... I don't know, it's something written about in like, I mean, you do have sci-fi with like, people who live forever, like, there, there's probably an SCP of somebody cursed with immortality. They will never die. And as the world grows weary, they have existed beyond when they should. They yearn for death, and it is the natural and good ending for all life. I don't quite subscribe to that fully. Maybe that's the case. But as far as I'm concerned, a hundred years is not enough time. I think people do good in the name of religion quite a bit. Um, but they also do bad. It's a mixed bag. The people do good things for religion as well. I should use mortality as a movie, should do something great. Yeah, and if you expand your concept of self to the concept of legacy, where it's like, my brain will stop working and I will die. But the impact I have on the world is also important to me, so I will leave a legacy. And then my consciousness will cease to exist. I will have had impact, and in that way, I will transcend death. That is also, I think, a common way of coping with death and with that. Uh, I don't know. Envisioning yourself as something more than the flesh and blood that I think you would currently tend to identify yourself as being. Having a finite period of time to do things is a key motivator and part of the balance in the world, in your opinion. That might be true. That might be true. Um, it definitely can be motivating for sure. I don't know if I would agree with it being like part of the balance. Like, I don't know. Maybe it is. Obviously, like overpopulation. Like, if no one ever died, then like things would be crazy. Like, I think we would have to find answers for those kinds of problems. Is death part of the balance? I I remember watching a, a video essay somebody did where it's like they very vehemently disagreed with acceptance of death and like acceptance like oh it's it's part of the balance life and death 
And I'm like, no. It doesn't have to be that way. Let's find another way. Let's, let's transcend that. Let's become... Let's not accept it. And I'm kind of on board with that. It's... I acknowledge it is a ridiculous and potentially unhealthy position to exist. But I want kick that spot. I want humanity to transcend that. I don't know, it's ridiculous. I, I know it's ridiculous in a way. At a macroscopic level, life cannot exist without that. I don't think that's true. I think that is an assumption that you're making, that you're asserting. Which, I mean, maybe it's true, but maybe it's not true. I think that one is up for debate. I think at a practical level, with the current way the world exists, that might be true. But I don't think it's fundamentally true that death require or life requires death to exist. I cannot live forever for the main reason of everyone around me dying and I am not. Also, I always think of the concept of floating in space not being able to die, but floating into nothingness forever. The things we all knew life ever to Yeah, at a practical level, the way evolution and biology works today. Yeah. There's life and death. You can't live without taking another life, even if it's a plant. I mean, sure, practically, yeah. But I think if we were to become transhuman, we could probably harvest energy directly from stars or something, and maybe those stars are dying as well. I mean, maybe there are finite limitations to the energy and entropy of the universe. But who knows? Maybe multiversal travel will become a thing. Maybe we'll find a way to reverse entropy. Or... Who knows? <laughs> like, hopefully, if we don't make ourselves go extinct, we don't get some comments slamming into the earth or whatever. We'll have a long time to deal with those problems and find solutions. Seven million years to question our own existence, heck yeah. Yeah, you can have no vision to everything, but once everything is done, there is nothing. What if Avapia is just a literal vampire that's trying to guess to think of being immortality by consuming the life force of others in the back? Keyword, Kimmer powered space colonization. All colonization is powered by Kumers, probably. Expanded I have to keep on cuming and having babies, so I need more land. It is to spread and dominate the genetic pool. You need to take as much resources for yourself and your genes as possible. So in a way, all expansionism, colonialism is driven by Kumarism. Instead of Coom, oh no! So the time capsule is the only thing that could serve the memory. She may have died, but it would be perfect. Time capsule can be as small as a few pops of spray in the bucket. Someone finds it from digging up the land years later. Or they can be as big as museums. She can pass on being displayed for future generations. If I really want to be immortal in that sense, then create my own historical events to be in the museum. 
Yeah, I still haven't dialed in my tongue. I need to, I don't know. Skill reader, I think that would be the practical result of transhumanism. People would at least have the option to stop living 100% on their own terms. Which in a weird way would make every death a suicide. Which is weird. If I want to live a thousand years, if I want to live a million years, maybe I could. If I get sick of it after a hundred years, who knows? I personally, I love learning though. I need to be better about using my knowledge to actually benefit the world in some way, but like, just learning and experiencing, I could do it forever. And maybe not forever. But I would certainly like to have more than a hundred years. Because the truth is, if you were to live for a thousand years or, or more, relationships, memories, the impact you have, finances, society as we know it would be fundamentally different in so many ways. Families would be different. Collecting like interest on some loan, like <laughs> you exist for a thousand years. The economy of, of interest would like, break down. Like we can't have every thousand year old being just be insanely wealthy because of interest. So many things would have to like be different than how they are. Altered carbon. I did a research paper on medical sense and they can die. People are content dying. They can die on their own terms without having. People can change minds. Everyone's dying and destroy themselves. How interesting. Yeah, sci fi has definitely address this topic a thousand times over and it's fun i like sci-fi that talks about transhumanism usually they take a dystopian spin on it though usually because it's more interesting and dramatic dystopias are more interesting for storytelling than utopias imo because like here's a story about this man who lives in a utopia. All of his needs were met. He lived happily, had loving relationships with people. The end. Oh well. Sorry, sorry, I heard something about Elon Musk creating cat girls, which will require a vast knowledge of how to do work, tanning, and such. My idea would make giant land daughters. Genetic engineering, that is another very interesting topic, full of controversy as well. I'm, 
really care yet. It is so amazing that our brains can be as complex when formed from like DNA. I don't know, because it's just like having structures and patterns. I don't know. The emergent behaviors that lead to consciousness, right? Mind boggling. I mean, I'm kind of like pro-transhumanism, the idea of modifying DNA, yeah. I don't know. There are definitely moral and ethical dilemmas. The truth though is that like the randomness that like brought about the human genome it's fascinating and amazing, but like, I don't think, yeah, like, I think there is room for improvement, for sure. Like, our bodies are so absurd and screwy, but the actual, like, practically messing with somebody's DNA, or the DNA of, like, a baby or fetus, who hasn't even had the chance to develop and grow the way we have, to get to a point where they would be able to consent to having alterations being done on their very being but at the same time you're like altering something that doesn't even exist yet this is a person that isn't even a person it's just like in like some dna and like an egg or an egg cell or whatever but like modifying their dna it's it's, it's amazing because like Parents do have to make choices, and doctors do, for babies that have no ability to make those decisions for themselves. I mean, frankly, the act of having sex is bringing about, or at least potentially bringing about, a conscious entity into the world. And so, like, that baby consented to being born, it didn't have any say in the matter, it didn't exist. So, like, you're making decisions for it that define its existence at all, and it has no say in it. Like, to then go in with, like, genetic engineering and modifying that existence without it being able to have any say or whatever, like, I don't know. Definitely a moral quandary, one I do not have an answer for. But I don't think it's a hard no. Maybe it is a no at the end of the day, but I don't know. Build a baby. Yeah, see that is. And, and, and frankly, like, the way that could eventually lead to, um, Further class separation. I'm wealthy. I can pay for doctors and engineers to give my offspring the best possible DNA, which will give them further advantages in their life and be built into their genome to be passed on to future generations. And they'll become even wealthier, even more powerful, smarter, stronger. And then they'll pass that DNA and have it further modified until we have an entire new species of hyper-wealthy, hyper-capable post-human beings that rule over the rest of what they pretty much consider to be a bunch of unwashed, stupid apes. That is the rest of humanity left behind. Like, I don't know. 
obviously the social problems that could arise from that are huge. And the fact of modifying someone's very being without their consent. Which, frankly, you're already doing by having sex in the first place. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, like, preventing what we would consider a defect. And like, who are you to say that having Down syndrome is a defect? They're as complete and whole an individual as anyone else. What if I consider being white a defect? Or having blue eyes, that's a defect. Like, so who gets to decide what is or isn't a defect? And what are the moral problems around that? What if... Because you can make the argument that it's like the DNA of any being that was naturally created through evolution and through the decisions of their parents to breed and procreate resulted in this unique, amazing individual and any modification of that natural process is blasphemous and unholy and terrible. Sex is, yeah, I mean, <laughs> historically sex is not always consensual. Rape is an unfortunate truth of the history of our species. But in modern society, yeah, consent is very important between sexual partners. But the, the truth of bringing a being into this universe, of creating a consciousness, a baby, that baby had no say in that. So it is, by its nature, unconsensual. We were all brought into this world without consent because we could not conceive. And of course we couldn't. We didn't even exist. The bringing a child into poverty or into wealth, whatever social situation you have, bringing a child and subjecting them to your parental behaviors like that's a decision you make and for that reason we do give parents a lot of power and rights in the decisions of having a baby and i think that makes sense like abortion that is ending the existence of a living potential like life and I do think parents should have that decision making. So my, my personal stance on abortion is that it should be up to the mother. It should be up to her to decide on whether or not to terminate that pregnancy because she also had the decision making process to create that in the first place out of sex. Unless, of course, she was raped, which is its own thing, where, like, there are women in this world who had no decision-making on to get pregnant because they were raped by someone and now they have this child inside of them that they did not consent to have. It is... I don't know. It's a mess. Life is messy. People are messy. Biology is messy. Morality. It's all a big mess. There are animals in the wild that will kill their young because they are experiencing environmental stress that maybe in some way there's some sort of decision. You can say animals even make decisions, but they react in such a way to environmental stress where they're like, I do not have the resources to raise this child. I am hungry. I can't produce milk. So I will eat my babies after they're born. It's pretty crazy. Ah, 
they're all just a giant map. Another reason why I believe I was born with the wrong gender is that a long time ago my mom told me that she had a miscarriage before I was born. This miscarriage would have been born female after hearing this, so I was just like, stuck in your head for years. My personal take on my own gender is that I was born male. What happened? Um, the DNA, my father's sperm or whatever, happened to have a white chromosome. And I'm, for me it is a choice. I am deciding to be a woman. And it's not an easy choice. There are a lot of factors going into it. I don't personally believe there was a right or wrong in like how I was born. It's just how it happened. It's just the fact, the reality into which I came into being or whatever. But either due to environment, perhaps due to my genetics or the way my brain was organized in the womb of my mother, who knows? But I am deciding to be a woman. It is a choice. It is the one I am making. And one I feel like I should have the right to make. And that I feel like anyone should have the right to make. Whatever your motivations are. Whatever your chromosomes say. Whatever your hormones say. Whatever. I think you should have the right to determine how you want to behave. How you want to live. What you want people to call you. I think you should have that choice. Decided to be a Pabiga too. That one might, that might be a purely genetic. Who knows? You know, at the end of the day, you're so beautiful to me. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. It's Abortion is... It is a complex topic. There is a reason that it's a big political issue. I think the general idea of aborting a pregnancy is like it doesn't sit easy in my stomach. I don't think generally it's a good thing to do, but I think that is the decision for the parent and the mother specifically to decide. Should fathers have a say in abortion? I don't know. I don't think it makes sense to, unfortunately. Would be, I don't know. If you could, if you could like transfer the fetus to the male to carry, then sure, but that simply doesn't exist. So yeah, I, I think it does make sense for the sole responsibility and decision making of abortion to rest with the woman carrying the child. And it's not, like, I mean, maybe that should be straightforward and obvious, but I will say, like, and that, and not necessarily it. Because if you are the father of a child, yeah, it sucks to not have any say. That, like, that's not, that's not an easy thing. That's not a good thing that you don't have any say. But, unfortunately, I think that is overruled by the... The physiology of pregnancy being something so intrinsically tied to the female body to that, yeah, I don't know. I agree. See, that, that is the practical reason why it's definitely, I think, up to a woman. Because, yeah, a woman should not be forced to undergo a pregnancy against her will. 
I think, I think that is the strongest argument and what it really boils down to when it comes to who should have the end all decision making in pregnancy and abortion. So I, I do agree with that. But that, like, that doesn't, I still don't think abortion is generally a good thing. Like, it's definitely would not be something I would say that you should consider as a first option, but it is ultimately up to the individual and the mother. Now, do, what do I think the social obligations of a man should be to a pregnancy he doesn't want? Honestly, I think that is also a question that can use some consideration. Should a father be forced to pay child support for a pregnancy that he did not want? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. It's a controversial topic though, for sure. Just use the butthole, then you won't get babies. True, Lamau. Oh my gosh. Or just have sex with me. I want to get bottom surgery. If you still want a vagina, I'm going to have one eventually. I still want to be able to get pregnant because medical science isn't there. But we can try. Honestly, as absurd as that sounds, Having the creation of new life become removed from traditional pregnancy might be an interesting, like, solution to that social conundrum. We exist in some weird sci-fi future where new lives are created by the government in a facility full of test tube babies to serve the state in indentured servitude. In this dystopian 1984 Orwellian future. And they'll all be ruled by me, by a fox split, supreme leader, for eternity. I have transcended humanity, become the god that you petty religious mortals wished you could be. And now you all serve me, my subservient little toys. And I'll genetically clone and manipulate you as I see fit. So you'll serve as my obedient little slave. The argument that embryos are not people, I don't think that's actually a very good argument. What are people except for a weird grouping of cells? The truth is... I don't know. She's really gone off the deep end now. I think for a practical reason, you're, you're actually right. The way the government views human beings, you do not exist until you get a birth certificate and a social security number and become an entity to the state. And we don't assign social security numbers to embryos. It's just a practical course. So that's kind of how things boil out. Do fetuses have the right to be born and exist? And that is hopefully what people hope to have happen to fetuses, but that's not always true. I do think it is unfortunate when an abortion has to happen or when that decision is made. It can still be the right decision. The right decision doesn't always make it a good decision in a way, I guess. Making the right choice can still be a tragedy, in a way. And I do feel that abortions are tragedies. 
I don't know. But yeah, ultimately, that is the decision of the mother. And I think that is where that power and decision making should be held. It's been human eggs on pedestal. Why are you putting human beings on a pedestal? We are also just common eggs with a little bit of time. We are we are no more or less important than fetuses. It's just the practical nature of pregnancy means that mothers should make that decision. Do you want the face tracking? Yeah. I think it's really cool as well. That is a bold, freezing cold thing. Yeah, biggest take, I guess. I think that fetuses are important. I think they are significant. But that decision making on that life or death should be up to the mother. And hopefully they understand the responsibility of that. But whether or not they do, it's their decision. How is that fair and equal? That the father can make the choice and the mother can. I think it just boils down to the practical nature of, of pregnancy. It is, by its nature, more involved for a woman to be pregnant than it is for a man to be the father of that child. But yeah, like it sucks. If you're a man and you want that pregnancy and the mother decides not to have it, that does suck. Like, I feel for you. But it is her choice. And it is, of all places, the more most reasonable for that decision making to lie there and only there within the mother makes that decision. I think unfertilized eggs and semen are valuable in their own way. It is genetic data capable of making a human being. And that's special and cool. That doesn't mean you can't masturbate. That's your genetic information to splurge all over your tissue paper and towels. But it is significant. It's, it's the truth. Every, every step of life is interesting and amazing and beautiful. I do. I love cum. <laughs> cum is amazing. Should a woman, is it okay for a woman to trap a man into fatherhood against their will? Yes. The answer to that is yes. If the father doesn't want to be a father and he got a woman pregnant, whether or not that child is carried to term is up to the woman. So the man, the man like base tank, yeah. The woman makes that decision on behalf of the father, on behalf of the baby, of everyone involved, that decision making goes to the hands of the woman because of the nature of how pregnancy works. I think how that baby should be treated and like how custody happens after birth can be its own conversation. A father having custody of a child, I think that should be a thing that both parents will have that joint custody and should there be problems and like the parents don't like each other, don't want to raise the child together, then that goes to court and the courts will have to decide who has custody of that child. 
And that is a very messy and sad situation. Something I know of too well. Not that I was, like, custody of me as a child was fought over for multiple years as I was growing up between my parents. It is a messy and ugly and terrible thing to do to a family and to a child. I don't think there's any better way to do it, though, than to have that be a civil court thing. Luckily, I don't think it happens so often that it's unmanageable to take care of in a legal system. It sucks, though. Like, again, that's... Having parents fight over custody, that is a tragedy. And there are no easy decisions. Even right ones are hard decisions to make. We are in church now. I went to church music. I just picked relaxing classical music. I don't know. These are very complex topics and these are only my opinions of it and I am a limited being with only my own experience and my own thought processes. lots of YouTube videos. Tons and tons of YouTube videos. But let's be honest, what a great way to like consume information. Freaking YouTube videos, video essays, lectures. Maybe reading textbooks would be faster and maybe better in some ways to absorbing and learning information, but freaking YouTube videos are awesome. Great way to get interest in something. Yeah, I think to get real knowledge requires a lot of reading and frankly a lot of practical experience, like first-hand experience in that subject. you want to learn about fixing cars, watch some YouTube videos and then go fix a car. YouTube is a great way to get a lot of that information, but definitely you'll learn best by actually getting your hands dirty. And that's probably true for neuroscience and religion or whatever else. Oh no, I didn't get a message. Oh, really? You know, this is a lot of big brain talk, but I really want her opinion on something in the chat. If you know, then don't say anything until after the game. So bread is bread, but in other places bread is called toast. When it's not toasted, how does that make you feel? It makes me feel like people are interesting and language is weird and there are no right answers and also Many right answers. And is salad a soup? Who knows? <laughs> so we're Catholic girls. I'm just going to follow painting. I've been before and it's an adventure every time. So no. Father, I have had a father for years in my life, but no one I can call a father, but when you write about it that way, unspent all, it's also important you should not go for the child too. 
So, Father, the only thing I'm pardoned. I mean, I don't know. Ideally, sounds like it's a pretty good idea to have two parents raise a child. They can hopefully have a good relationship with each other, be supportive, help each other out. And I think that usually that's the case. Most parents, there's usually two of them. They usually at least try and support each other. Sometimes they're good at it. Sometimes they suck. But there are definitely exceptions to that. And it just makes life hard. For a lot of reasons. Partially just because the social norm and expectation is to have two loving parents. So just because that's the norm. And there are exceptions to that. Just being an exception in and of itself can suck. But there are a billion there are at least 7 billion ways to raise a child because there are 7 billion people on this earth so there are at least that many ways to raise someone hopefully the people involved try their best to teach and love and care for their children You have a lot of working women friends as or colleagues you hang out with IRL. Um, yeah, there are. I mean, so my working life is streaming. But like, in my D&D group, yeah, I would say about a third of them are cisgendered women. That I hang out with. And that's most of my social life. It's Dungeons and Dragons. I've started doing like open mic nights as well. And, um, of the group of, like, four of us, one of them is a cis girl. And then there's me. I'm a trans girl, which is weird. I have some insights on being a girl and being feminine. And I, I like, I'll acknowledge I have a lot of blind spots as well. I just have my own personal experience. I definitely know what it's like to be a transgender girl. Don't know what it's like to be a cis man or cis woman. I'm something else, and I accept that. And sometimes there are things I know about. Sometimes there are things I don't know. As a transgender woman, I wish more than anything in the world that I could get pregnant. That I could have a womb, and ovaries, and go through stupid, crappy period cramps and have that experience. I wish that could have been the way I was born. But like I accept the reality that that is not how I was born. And though there are some things I can change with the resources I have, I won't have the same experience in my life that a cisgendered woman will have. And I'm accepting that. So I don't know. And yeah, it's good to have a diversity of friends from all spectrums. The truth of how people work though is often we tend to relate to people who are the same gender as us, or the same interests, or the same whatever. So to be honest, a lot of my friends in the last two years are all trans women. <laughs> them out. So, I don't know. I would say that in the last two years, new friends I've made have been predominantly transgender or gay or like 
as I have explored my transition, my experience, it has led me to other people who kind of fit under that LGBTQ umbrella. So you can see how you might not understand the challenge of those things since you don't experience them yourself. Even if I wish for them. Yeah, I agree. My my experience is my own. That's why I I'd say that I am limited to the things I know and the things I have gone through. I know women. I have a lot of sisters. I have a mother. I have women colleagues and friends. And so I can experience some things back at hand through what they share with me. But um yeah. Ultimately, my opinions are limited to my experiences. I, I, I think my opinions are valid and worth consideration and worth sharing, I guess. But they are, they are fundamentally my own and come from my knowledge. So like, do I have the right to speak on pregnancies and the rights of women and fathers and stuff? I've never been pregnant. I'm never going to be pregnant. I'm likely never going to get anyone pregnant because I like God. So I'm never going to be a biological parent. So do I have any right to talk about pregnancy at all? I think so. I can share my opinions. You can feel free to discard them. Whatever. I mean, I think as we express our opinions, we definitely tend to express them as like, I'm right, this is how the world is. And if you don't believe me, you're wrong. Like, we all do that. But I hope that I am. we all understand that I'm an idiot. <laughs> and I'm, I'm limited to just what I know and what I believe and think. Like, I don't know. Do I understand the universe in its entirety to me without judgment on all things that are beyond dispute? No, not at all. If a male train conductor wanted to be female, then wouldn't they be a trains woman? The valley would, Joe. I do be a stretch. <laughs> Weirdly political, the last two streams. I don't know why. Yeah. One of my hopes, my ambitions, is to one day be a mother. Because of my circumstances, I'll have to adopt a child, which I think could be a beautiful and wonderful experience. Not one I'm ready for right now, but I do want to be a mother. And perhaps if there's some <laughs> young, dumb teenager or, or whatever other circumstances that led to a pregnancy that was unplanned for, they do not feel like they are able to support in their lives financially or emotionally or whatever, I hope that I will have the opportunity to be ready financially and emotionally to step in and be a parent for a young developing mind and that I will have that opportunity for my own personal growth and to have that 
opportunity for service of, of someone else who needs it. I don't know. That seems like a very distant ambition, though. I my current point. Because this is one being a lot weird to me, but... older than me, Ark. You're like five, six years older. It's not even that big a difference. Fox adopted children, even older ones, have insane social skills and empathy. Will love you just as much as you bear as a child. I hope so. I don't think love comes out of having the same genes as someone else. I think it comes from service and... Mainly service. I mean, other things as well. But true love comes from, like, doing things for each other's benefit. Nine years older? <laughs> I don't want to say it, but like, that's definitely within my dating range. I would totally date a guy who's like nine years older than me. I don't know. I don't know how old I would date. I mean, I know some people are like, age is just a number. I don't see myself dating someone as old as my dad, though. I don't think I would do that. So there's definitely a cutoff somewhere. My uncle adopted a seven-year-old in his early 70s, and that boy is the most loving, brightest kid I've ever seen. We can tell there was well, there needs to be felt with love. We changed my uncle's life as well. Honestly, Crocs, you have like pets. You have like a cat. I'm not even ready for that. I don't think I can have a small dog right now or a cat or anything. Like, I'm not even ready for that. Let alone a baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that would be too much. I can't handle it. Being completely honest, right now, I am an exceptionally egocentric, selfish person. I am like, not at all in a position, mentally, financially, or anything, to take care of someone else. Honestly, I don't even know if I'm ready for a relationship. I feel like I am, mostly because they can take care of themselves as well. I don't know. I've tried the relationship thing, kind of, in this pretend land of your chat. It has not gone well. So, <laughs> I don't know. I travel almost every month so I just spoil other people's kids and pets. Yeah. Having a kid means you know that in some ways. You decide all your bullcrap and focus on being the best for you in an innocent life. I 
I think that's true in a lot of ways. Maybe ego death is something I can use a little bit of. Honestly, so this is something my dad said, and I don't know how much I believe him or not on this subject, but he made the assertion that transgender women are very egotistical people, very ego-focused, very focused on themselves. I don't know how true that is. It seems like maybe it has some truth to it, I think. But yeah, I agree. I don't think ego is inherently bad either. And I, I, I think that does make sense. I know I am a very egocentric person right now. I, I certainly assert my beliefs about my gender. And frankly, the process of transitioning is like expensive, resource intense. It takes up a lot of my thinking time of like being a girl or whatever. In a way it's like being a child again. You have to like reform your brain to being feminine, to be a girl. I feel like I have gone through like it is called a second puberty when you transition. Both from the hormones and I think also just mentally you kind of reorganize your brain as you try and fit into this social role of being a woman. And children are completely egocentric. A hundred percent. They can be ruthlessly unempathetic because of how egocentric they are. They by and large don't even understand that other people are thinking human beings as well is how egocentric children can be and i feel like trans women probably go through that again in a way i don't know and i'm sure it varies her case, there are as <laughs> many variations on being transgender as there are transgender people. And I, I, I think my, probably my fascination on immortality does come from a very egocentric standpoint. Wanting to live forever is a pretty egocentric thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, kid, kid theories, kid observations. Sometimes they can be refreshing, sometimes not so much. Wow. Do you ever have a dream where you could ever be, ever do whatever you want? Kids are great, and they're also Papaya, but so am I. I'm pretty pretty, but I'm also very pooping at it. There's mental stress to dysphoria. Our friends probably going to accept you as some stranger gonna harass you today. Yeah, true. It's hard. It's a mess.
big thanks to you, Rain. Yeah, we just had some decay. We must have gotten like a hundred bomb last month. And it's like... <laughs> Goodbye! Streaming is... a challenge. For sure. And I need to get a dumb job. Just a supplementary job. I, I want to get something part-time. Just something where, like, if I miss a week of streaming because I'm Papaya, which I am, I won't miss rent because of it. That way, like, streaming can be... You can use it to, like, pay for, like, buying clothes, or, like, eating out, or, like, buying a new VR headset or something. But not be, like, oh, you're getting affected. Have fun. Which has happened. I can do a hacking stream. But the best part about my work is when you meet people learning about each other. It is being productive together. I'm a weird streamer. I don't know. Probably not the weirdest though. There are definitely weirder streamers. I should go, I should move, I should go move around, go dance. I, I um, <laughs> really struggled to do like cozy ASMR streams recently. Every time I came out here, I actually muted myself. After I did my whole little lecture on brain anatomy, I came out here and I was going to do like some ASMR. It's like be cozy. And instead I talked about abortion and consciousness, transhumanism, transgenderism, and whatever. I can't just shut up and like do ASMR anymore. The wow. I'm too busy taking on all the controversial topics in the world. Which is a very dumb thing to do as a streamer. I don't know, I... I like talking about things that people avoid. Or make people uncomfortable sometimes. I don't know, because if I'm wrong about my view of transhumanism or abortion or whatever, it's good to get those contrasting opinions and to reevaluate. Because I can be wrong. I can be wrong about all sorts of stuff. Being able to discuss it and express my opinions and read your guys' opinions is good. Let me have some time between doing this, expose you, please. Yeah. I'm sure it probably alienates some people, I'm sure. Things that I've said, people in chat have disagreed with, maybe not said anything, and just been like, I don't like this person, and left. So. I don't know. Versus just like muting my microphone and doing this. And a little bit of this. And a little bit of this. And a little I'd get much higher numbers, I'm sure.
Okay, I'm gonna go down this boat. I'm gonna move. Oh, that is definitely something that I have discovered about myself through VR chat and streaming. I definitely am more positive and feel better if I am physically active. I don't know. I hate gyms. I hate running. I hate exercise. It sucks. It's boring. It's uncomfortable. So if you can find something that is exercise that you enjoy, like dancing, or taekwondo, or fencing, for me I love that, because you get that exercise, you end up getting those endorphins, you feel good, but at least you're doing something interesting. Because like running on a treadmill, it's so boring and dumb and uninteresting and I hate it. But doing Taekwondo, I'm like doing some warm ups before that where you do do a little bit of running, but then you like do sparring and you're sweating and you're kicking, you're punching and you're trying to read your opponent and you're trying to like move and dodge. That's so much fun. Or dancing where it's just like free musical expression. I'm free in a move. Movement. I love it. Have I tried track running? A little bit. And I hated it. I, I, there was um, a period where I tried going to like the like local high school track or whatever. I'm just doing a few laps. I freaking hate it. It sucks. Running sucks. I hate running. Running is really good for you and I hate it. Rowing sounds fun. I think I would prefer biking over running. I'm so used to video games where you just run in video games at superhuman speeds for insane periods of time, never break a sweat, and you just get to see, like, running around in Skyrim or like Horizon Zero Dawn when you see these beautiful vistas and you're running through them super fast. In real life, it takes forever to get anywhere on foot. You're just like, <laughs> and you're like, uh, okay, I just need to make it to the end of this block. I just need to make it to the end of this next block. Oh, like, when do I get to see another intersection? And like, some houses, boring. At least with a bike, you're getting through it faster. Running fun, jogging terrible. Yeah, I guess sprinting can be pretty fun. Sprinting is definitely more intense. When you get there as fast as you can, then you're like done. Whereas jogging just takes forever. I mean, it's good to have. Like, that is kind of an important thing about exercise is doing it for a long time so you actually are burning calories over time and doing cardio. Cardio is like the best thing ever. But it kind of does, it does take a while. I don't know. I guess that's why I like dancing though. It's like it so far has been my favorite form of cardio because you gotta listen to music and you gotta like move to the music because I guess you can listen to music while you jog obviously but I don't know you just feel more engaged when you're dancing and I feel like if you're going hard while you're dancing it can be as much of a cardio workout as um like actual running A 
else is my trapped demons died. Come on, trap. Please work. I think I need a new USB cable for my headset. And a better way to like secure it to everything. King's wall. <laughs> okay, yeah. um, you know, that would be a fun project for me to do. I mean, I already have the money, um, but I kind of want to take the elements of the dancing world I go to and just make them into, like, a portable avatar-based system so I can go dance anywhere. I guess like so also like your personal goals, what you're trying to accomplish or how you want to like will also impact what kind of exercise you want to do. I'm not looking to get swole. I don't want big muscles. Um, I just want to be able to dance for a while and have a nice looking butt and a skinny waist. And I want somebody to be able to pick me up and pin me up against a wall. So for me, um, cardio sounds like the best way to get there. Well, it would be nice to steal that Suko, but I think I could automate this because all this system is is just a, ca a couple of cameras that are swinging around, which could be super easy to animate. Um, figure things out that way. Yeah, well, I don't want to get swat. <laughs> I want to be small and petite. And like... I want to weigh nothing. I want to weigh like 103 pounds. Be like a freaking weight of a human being. That some guy can just toss me around. But wow. Yeah, like if you're doing like aerobatics, having core and stuff so that you can hold your body rigid. But I'm talking about, and I do want to have decent core, that would be good. But I just want a guy to like pick me up by my hips and just thrust into me. Wow. Well, so, yeah, whatever it takes for that, that's my goal. I'm thrusting cackles. Okay, I'm gonna mute my mic before I say anything else now. Try and pick out the music.
Okay, YouTube music is not working right now. What the heck? It's just like buffering. There we go. I, I can't get these memories out of my mind And some kind of madness has started to evolve so hard to let you go but some kind of madness is swallowing me whole yeah. I have finally seen the light and I
tune your ears to the grinding gears. Come with me, I'll show you how to be a metal man. When the gears are turning and the fires are burning. When the world ticks around, your voice is talking all the time. And you live for sleep, you never slept. Because you cannot sleep. Or Colonel Walter was shocked when he learned from the Nile. Copper African elephants are turning hostile. So we built these wonderful towers on both. And a very big steam powered cheer and will smoke. Now the war is past and over. We'll have to see it and wonder. And what is real? And why do living things need feeling? One, two, three. La, 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 la. So wet and cold, it starts rusting. When the world ticks around, your voice is talking all the time. You live for feelings you never felt because you cannot feel. And what is this leaking effect in my eye? Does the oil that is dripping mean this is a crime? Will I ever be something with feelings to hide? Or am I just a boiler with nothing inside? I want all to. You're not a living thing with feeling. He, he. One, two, three. La, 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 la. Smokes.
my circuits a star of flame but too deep oh the turpentine erase me whole cause who don't want to live my life alone Let me free my honey.
my funds to know? Where does my savings money go? It goes to the cutest little dancer that I know. Sip drink on the rocks. Then I'll pay my favorite fox. In tier three subs and bits on stream today. Buy a fox, you're the one. The one I'm gonna spend all my money on. My bank account is spent and gone, but it's all worth it for you, hun. Buy a fox, you're the best. So please accept this golden chest. Full of riches, I fulfill your wishes. Got more cash than all these other. My wife wants to know. What does my paycheck money go? It goes to the sweetest little mouth breather I know. Let's start a high train. Cause I'm about to make it rain. Farm and park champs in the jet all night and day. Buy a fox, you're the one. The one I'm gonna spend all my money on. My bank account is spent and gone. But it's all worth it for you, hun. Buy a fox, you're the best. So please accept this golden chest. Alpha for your wishes, gift more subs than all these other sh I got that new fever It ain't gonna go away anytime soon I got that new fever, baby Yeah, I got that new fever, baby Oh, they be walking, they be dancing They be moving to the beat But they surely ain't gonna be talking Yeah, I got that new fever, baby you fever, baby You see them all around you From the part of the stage Encapsulated by the movements And their playful ways And you know there's only one thing to say You got that mute fever Encapsulated by the movements And subliminal ways You got that mute fever The waking hours in the game from the bottom of the stage Oh, they be walking, they be dancing They be moving to the beat But they surely ain't gonna be talking Yeah, I got that new fever, baby Mute fever, baby You see them all around you From the bottom of the stage Encapsulated by the movements And their playful ways And you know there's only one thing to say you got that mute fever Encapsulated by the movements and subliminal ways You got that mute fever The waking hours in the gate of from the bottom of the stage You got that mute fever You got that mute fever Dances, captivated by those seductive glances. You'll never escape them, try as you might, for this marks the end of our fateful night. Patrons come in search of leisure, unknowingly they succumb. Encapsulated by the movements and 
Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Watches of slide. See, like, you can see it, like, running down the track and track. It's just flat. I kind of want to do a villain song. Balance songs are the past to dance to. Like Hell of Fire, The Dark of the Night, Nimmer, Mr. Nice Guy. Imagine if we took the DNA of everyone that's given the IST23 the after all and we perfect tongue. We need a baby with it. for longer. I should probably start timing it and dancing for like a specific period of time. I don't think I would want to dance for more than an hour at most.
maybe I should like try and like mix it up as well so I do like talking segments in between dancing. I don't know. It's hard to know the best way to do it. Ow! That was my wall. <laughs> Minus five brain cells. I only have like seven left. Oh no. <laughs> Literal lullaby song playing right now. It's a good cardio exercise. It's so much fun. Yeah, I should figure out playlists. That's what I used to do when I was dancing like every stream at first. I would put together like a half hour long playlist to like 45 minutes. actually takes time to like put together a half hour playlist every day so I would spend about that much time putting the playlist together like an extra half hour to hour outside of stream every day just picking music to dance to those were good times it's like dancing ASL ASMR, like a little bit of world exploration. I'm convening just a little bit. I feel like dancing used to be my most popular, like, segments. People are always cheering. See all sorts of claps. It was a good time. People actually used to know me as a dancer. Everyone I talk to nowadays is like, Oh my gosh, I'm so surprised that you danced. Wow. I would have never guessed. Oh no. No one thinks I can dance. Because I can't. I'm not a very good dancer. I want to, um, dance more. I want to, like, go to dancing classes. Like, um, I don't know, there's, like, this one community that does dance classes. But the only one they do consistently, consistently is, like, a beginner class on 
strip dancing, or like lap dancing, I guess. I need to find some actual good dancing communities that do like performance dancing. But on hip hop, those are the two options in VR chat camera dancing or like hip hop. I want a ballet group or like a jazz dance group or like a, I don't know, whatever dancing my dancing is. I don't know what I would call it. Not hip hop. It's not break dancing. It's like, I don't know. The closest I've seen to what I want to do when I've looked up dance tutorials is it's simply called Heels. And it's kind of like, I don't know, a better version of strip dancing at IMO. I've, I've seen like the kind of dancing I want to learn. It, it is just called heels, which is kind of a dumb name for a genre of dance. But um, yeah. Also, I would say compared to that, that I do a lot of like jumping and like leaping and twirling. I do a lot of twirling. I'm a little twirly. A little twirl. I did a year of ballet when I was a kid. My sisters were in ballet throughout like elementary school to like high school. They were in ballet. My one sister actually did a little bit in college as well. And I've seen like my sister used to just practice a lot in like the living room at our house. And I used to love the way she danced. She was really adorable. I know I get to dance that way, and I'm so happy about that. Actually makes me feel amazing. I was really, like, jealous of my sisters growing up. I just wished I could be like them. It was kind of fun to be able to do that as a streamer. Express all that pent up femininity, a desire to dance and be adorable and lovely and energetic. In fact, there's one song in particular that I want to dance to. I keep forgetting to add it to my set. It's from Wicked. It's the song Popular. I remember my sister, for one of her classes, she had to like make a choreography of her song. And the song she chose was Popular from Wicked. And so she would like dance that over and over again. And I like watched her and like, I'm like, I want to dance like that. So maybe I'll add that song to a set list and try making up a choreography to it. Well, look who Teresa, look who's dancing to it now. It's me. It's so funny, if you look up my siblings' names, things that you pull up are like 
scientific papers and like their like positions at like universities like research affiliates and you like look at my name well if you look at my like birth name you'll find anything if you look at my like firefox blue it's just like oh look at this little twitch streamer wow they have a wikipedia page of being a mute on vr chat that hasn't been updated for like a year and a half. I think it's a pride thing, like a, a cloud thing. I can't update my own wiki page. I have to have my fans do it for me. If I do it for myself, that's just narcissistic. I have to be so cool that but my fans will write about me. Uh, It is really interesting that, like, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like the lobby has changed so much since I left. And yet, in so many ways, it stayed the same. But I guess, <laughs> maybe I'm biased, but I feel like my time at the lobby, and for a little while after I left, was like the golden ages of that lobby. And the best RP arcs and stuff like that. But I remember, I remember um, talking to Spellboy, who came to the lobby after like a long absence. And he felt the same way too. He's like, yeah, back in the day when I was here, we had so much better RP and like things were more interesting. Well, he does predate me, yeah. But that's why I bring him up. Like, I look at my time at the lobby as being, like, the best time the lobby had. And, like, Spellboy felt the same way, even though they were, like, before me. Like, a completely different time. And so I'm sure it's just bias. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm not saying he was referring to the time I was there. He was talking about when he was involved before I was. Back when they did like the Red Man arc and like the um and like giant missile. They had that like tree house where like Jor lived, like way back when. Degen Night has changed so much as well. It is actually Degen now. When it first started it was just like people hanging out in the like empty bar. Now it's like <laughs> actually a full on DJ. I saw it. Crumpet go up to Laser and be like bend over. Laser bends over. And Crumpet just starts dry humping them from behind. Then, like, RP pushes them over and just, like, mounts them and starts humping and moaning on top of them. It's like, wow. DJ Knight has come quite a long way. I was just, like, going from, like, mute to mute just doing that to them. I was like, oh my gosh. It has changed quite a bit. I do not need this in the box. How many do you Gargling <laughs> balls. Oh my gosh. The break. The break. Thank you for the sub. 
Yeah, the human face is born drama for the human, which is what I'm looking for right now. Wow. It is actually amazing how much drama actually comes out of that. And a lot of it is real because it's just like drunk idiots. They are way too drunk to be RP. <laughs> just having just actual drama. It's fun. I know I love classic. I'm a little chicken. That music her number from Music Man. Okay, QC. Thank you for hanging out. See what else happened at the gen night. Since when the bottle, it started out pretty slow this last, like yesterday. Everyone was like playing Halo. I think Mango was like streaming Halo and a bunch of people were hanging out. Cause I was watching Claw 2. Cause I was just in the Gator Discord. And like Claw 2 was streaming it. So it looked like Mango was having a lot of fun with her community. Doing like a Halo night and a bunch of theater people were playing as well. And I think that went a little bit late. The DJ night was a little slow to start up. Um, but it was occupied with that. And I was talking to them about if I were to have a drink, what should I think? I wonder what you guys think. So, I have never had alcohol in my life. I've never drunk straight alcohol. I've used cooking wine before, but I've never, like, actually drunk in, like, straight wine or, like, beer or anything. So, I want to know, what would the best drink be to start with? Would I want to go for, like, a cool wine? Maybe, like, some wine snob? I feel like a fruit slushy with alcohol sounds delicious. <laughs> and, well, I solicited it from Crumpet and everyone else who's in the call, so like Claw 2 and Dottie was there. And a bunch of other people. Somebody was saying Kahlua with pineapple juice is really good. Because Kahlua is apparently like coconut rum. And that sounds delicious, because I love, like, pina colada coconut flavor. I just wonder what would be a good drink. It isn't. I, okay, so I have a friend, IRL, who has like a bar in their basement. Oh, Kahlua is coffee liqueur. What is coconut rum? It was something else. They said it was coconut rum. Maybe I, it was something else. But this is a means to an end. It's not about what you should drink. It's about available on here. Where you are. But it's coming up, it's not coffee. Coconut rum is space. Coconut rum is Malibu. That's what it was. It was Malibu they were talking about. Yeah, yeah, they were talking about Malibu. They're saying Malibu with pineapple juice. It was delicious. I hate all of that. Bye. Okay, so one so one drink that I think would be interesting to start with would be a unique start, maybe. Would be absinthe. Because it's such a weird, like old timey hard liquor. 
But I love Licorice and like Anise and like Fennel. And I think Fennel and Anise are the same thing. I think Fennel is like the Indian word for it and Anise is the like English word for it. Or maybe they're just two very similar plants. They have a similar like licorice flavor, which is the predominant flavor of um, absinthe, I think. Am I like Jägermeister? Jägermeister sounds like such a chad drink. Like, yo bro, let's go spout on a bunch of Jäger. Party on, bro. Oh, that would be good. Isn't what is a Jaeger palm? I don't actually know what a Jaeger palm is. It's popular folklore that it, there's that has deer's blood in it. Keep it lemur on and cooks always safe fat as long as not bomb burrow and burns everything. Do a rum and coke. And I don't know, like, should I start with something lighter, something like a beer, or like a, a wine that is less alcoholic, or like, should I do like a mixed drink, or maybe like a like straight absinthe? Just, just I'll do a straight shot of absinthe and pass out and be like, worst experience ever, drinking like vacuum cleaner or something. Old fashioned is easy or gin and tonic. See, Crumpet was telling me I should do Long, Long Island iced tea. He was saying, like, first time I got drunk, I went to an Olive Garden and just got Long Island iced teas. And that's what you told me I should do. Long Islands or margaritas are tasting good on easy. Look at you, right? Act up. Pina coladas. See, that sounds good to me. Like, or the, I like mimosas, like some sort of like orange or like passion or mango fruit drink with like alcohol. That sounds delicious. You do Long Islands and you'll never want to drink again because you will not remember anything. Okay, so that is something. I would not want to, like, drink to the point where I don't remember. I don't like that. I see that way too much in VR chat. And it makes me not want to drink at all. I never want to drink to a point that I am out of control entirely. I'm not even able to remember what's going on. Like, I would like to sit down, have a nice dinner, and then like two or three drinks or something. I don't know how much, I don't know how much that is. Like if I had like two like drinks, like a, a pina colada and like a mimosa or something. Or like a Long Island iced tea and like a pina colada. I don't know if that would, like, I don't know how hacked up I would be. I have no idea why I'd be like if I was drunk, too. I really don't know. That would be the most interesting part, though, to see what I'm like when I'm drunk. I don't know if I would be very, like, I could be an angry drunk. There are definitely, Dark Rocks knows this. I have DM Dark Rocks, and like, I am just upset this week. For some reason, everything is making me angry right now. So I definitely have a side to me where I just get frustrated at stuff. But 
but I'm also a super coomer. I can also be pretty lovey dovey. I have no idea what being drunk would be like. My guess is you'd be a clingy drunk, super affectionate. Like, that sounds like what I would want to be if I could pick. I would want to be super affectionate. But I also feel like I might end up being super crazy and like, people like, I would never have guessed Firefox was a super crazy drunk. Or what if I was a super angry drunk? And I just like started yelling at everyone and like started blaming everyone and been like, Oh, you're the reason my stream died and I'm not doing well and I'm poor and like, I hate ya. And you suck. Cause I might, I might be that way. I don't know. I could be a terrible person. There is a side of me that is pretty spiteful sometimes. Which I'm not proud of. To be honest, when I like broke up with Blue Haze, or well, I guess she broke up with me, and then when Crumpy like broke up with me, I freaking hated their gut. I was like a spiteful bitch. It's not good. It's not a pretty side of, of myself. It was actually pretty bad. <laughs> Being Rob's mute with Blue Haze, we were like hyper competitive with each other because like we did not like each other. It was not good. It was actually a, a pretty toxic environment looking back at it. And I, I definitely contributed to it. I should have been a better person, but I guess I I've, I've learned this about myself. I'm like looking back at those relationships. When I get hurt emotionally over those kinds of feelings, I kind of use it as an excuse to like let myself be a bad person, which is not good. I need to be a better. Cause I'm like, you hurt me. I loved you. You told me you loved me and it was so happy and meaningful to me and then like you totally like cheated on me in the one case or just like straight up broke up with me for your career or like whatever and I just like to me I felt so hurt and betrayed and I let that be an excuse to like just be mean be vindictive be cruel and just like not a good person So, I don't know. I, I'm not really ready for another relationship. Maybe I am. I don't know. But whatever happens, I hope that if it does not end well, that I can be more understanding and empathetic and, like, chill. I don't know. For me, relationships are meaningful and important, so it's hard when I feel like the other person just didn't take it seriously, they just didn't care, and I feel super betrayed. But I need to not let that turn into like feelings of, of hatred and anger, and like using it as an excuse to be spiteful. Moonshine. Does Hooch exist in North America? Yeah, Hooch, I think that is just a, a term for self-made distilled alcohol. Moonshine. Just like the... Oh, my dad used to watch that show. About these, like, two brothers that, like, drove around some, like, car delivering moonshine and they would like have little chases with the cops and stuff I forget what it was called 
I love sour cream and strawberry wheat percentage. I'll get a pop that's available in UK called Hooch. It's like maybe alcoholic lemonade. But I wouldn't know <laughs> if that exists in the US or not then, I guess. I don't know, like, brand names for drinks or, like, stuff. I don't like my booze to be sweet at all. I think I would want it to be sweet. I would want, I want a, like, a fruit smoothie with alcohol. Or, well, I just want a fruit smoothie. I don't I mean, generally, I, I don't like, I like sweet drinks. I mean, I'm raised off of, like, soda pop and milkshakes. So if you have a cold beverage, it should be sweet. Cause like honestly like wassail and stuff, I don't like red. Like, I think I would like wine if it was alcoholic grape juice. I wonder if that is a drink you can get where Rather than making wine, they just have alcoholic grape juice where it's like still sweet and delicious. Just have some wine. I don't know how, like, how sweet is wine compared to just straight up grape juice? Yeah, that, that is what I thought, because of the fermentation process, wine would not be sweet. I don't know, I would have to have a really good reason to drink, like a really good reason. I would want to make like a stupid event out of it. I don't know if I trust myself in like two ways. I don't know if I trust myself with being able to just not be an alcoholic. But I also don't know if I trust myself with being and letting my inhibitions down. I hold a lot back. I my secret self in my head can be extraordinarily judgmental and mean and I try not to like let that define who I am I don't know and I'm not I'm afraid that if I got drunk I would just say mean stuff because I think mean stuff all the time and it's not good Oh 
Okay, I'm kind of hating things. I kind of... And it's hard to, like, get really good music off of epidemic sounds sometimes. Solo guitar is good. Is that? I used to drink a lot and was not good. And so I had to stop right here and I was fine. I want to get a fat filled mask. I, I love that. the raid, zombie girl. A zombie agree, girl. Slipper pie. Such a pretty map. I love this map. The like way the dock is built. It reminds me of like the kind of thing you would see at like a national park. Just like some old structure people use. So you come and visit. Have some good food. Before you go, you have to tell me what you're cooking about. Okay, let's go. I like butter at a distance. You know it's really bad though with this map. Cause when you look straight down. Oh. Trippy! Oh, chicken parm is delicious. Chicken parm and like Malibu chicken. Which is like chicken parm but with ham. Because why not? And chicken cordon bleu is delicious as well. It's not like what Malibu chicken is. Out of my mind, am I crazy? So you just have like breaded chicken, like you do for chicken parmesan, and then you like have a slice of cheese. I think usually Swiss, and then I will know not. Well, first, so you have the chicken, the slice of ham. And then top that with a, like, a slice of Swiss cheese. Or maybe you just do mozzarella. It might just be mozzarella. 
And then I think it's still served with the red sauce though. Maybe it's a local thing. I mean, it's not super common, but I've seen it at various diners and like Italian restaurants. Maybe it's served with a hollandaise sauce or something. Or Malibu sauce. The most important part of its sauce is made of mayonnaise and mustard. Yeah, so it is Swiss. Okay, so Malibu chicken, I guess you don't do it with red sauce. Yeah, it's just breaded chicken, ham, Swiss cheese on top, and then a sauce that's made out of mayonnaise and mustard, I guess. I swear you do breaded. I've had it breaded when I've had Malibu chicken. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's just roasted chicken. No, I see pictures of breaded chicken as well. I'm just looking it up on Google. So yeah, it's just like breaded chicken, ham, Swiss cheese. I don't know. Try it out. It's pretty good. It's kind of like a cordon bleu, yeah. But skipping all the like steps of like planning out the chicken and like stuffing it and stuff, I guess. Kind of like an easy version of chicken cordon bleu, I guess. very simple. I just season my chicken with, it's, it's actually a seasoned mix that I just buy. And I just use it because my mom used to use it. So I just like the flavor. It's just um, Montreal seasoning is what it's called. Montreal chicken seasoning. So I just cover my chicken in that and then fry it in olive oil. I just like cut it up into like chunks. Stick on the seasoning, fry it in olive oil, and then throw it in a salad. My, my like everyday salad that I do is very simple. It's just like lettuce, tomato, olives, mozzarella, chicken. And I usually go through Brianna's flesh wine vinaigrette, which is my favorite. Um, salad dressing, I got Montreal spices are bomb. Yeah, I like Montreal spices, I guess. Okay, I usually do chicken breast. I will sometimes do chicken thighs. But honestly, on a salad, I kind of prefer breast. Because it's just kind of keeps with the lighter tone of a salad. Because chicken thighs, I think, have more fat or something. So they tend to be a little more greasy. The meat tends to feel more greasy in your mouth, which doesn't really fit with the salad. I don't think I even wear it anymore. My throat. Excuse me.
do not know. of getting my new avatar was for the face tracking on the head. for this time. This like, I'm pretty proud of it. This outfit I actually did make from scratch. The sweater is like 100%. Uh, at least the 3D modeling is 100% from me. The original concept was from artwork that Imperial got from me, I think. but old body. Avatar is more realistic in proportion while still being sexy. I don't know. Definitely the butt is like smaller. It's have like a smaller lower body. But this also has like flex bones and twist bones that make it really good. different. Now that like I've grown used to this avatar and the novelness of it has worn off a little bit, I do find myself kind of missing my old avatar more, but not enough to switch back. They are substantially different though. I can pull faces at you right now and you won't see them. You have like eye tracking. I'm also super washed out in this map with this avatar. Like, um, I 
I'm, I'm really used to toggling my expressions on and off. To be like, happy or sad. My. But with new avatar, I just pull the faces with my face. I don't have a really good mad face. I can smile, and I can frown. Oh, that's my best mad face. Mr. Dockers, how are you? is to get though. I can just pull faces without thinking about it. And that's so cool. In fact, so the default controller map things for VR chat. So you have like a couple buttons on your controllers that you can push. I set up my controllers that I would always have easy access to locking my expressions on and off, which now I do not use at all, 0%. I don't even touch it, because whether or not my expressions are toggled on or off for this avatar makes zero difference. So now both of my A buttons on my controllers do nothing. So maybe I'll try messing with my brain. system where it will set up all of the animation layers for you so you can modify the um, blender files and then import that into unity and then run a script that he wrote that sets up your entire avatar ready to upload the only problem with that is that um if you're doing different clothes, then maybe it won't work as well. I don't know, I'll have to play with it. Because this has the most complex animation layers I've ever seen on any avatar ever. For handling the face expressions, all the clothing, the little touch menu that you can do. There's so much. So, the jacket does have a, um, a blend shape to do the hoodie down. There's nothing set up in the animations to actually control that. That is something I could add very easily because the blender file supports it. There is a blend shape for having the hoodie down. My voice is getting very rough right now. not quite ready for VR chat. I just set it up so it would work more or less with the relatively minor amount of movement you have on a VTuber. Also, I have this <laughs> leash that I haven't even like done dynamic bones for. There's also like problems with clipping and I want to add cloth for the The 
this was just like an early upload. There's also some animation controllers so that if you if you make this avatar go naked, if you join another world, it will put clothes back on when you load in, so you won't load in naked, which is actually really cool. But I have to turn that off if I have other clothes on. And you can see my boobs are clipping right through. You can see it before because I actually had a bra on. Also, my eyes are right here. My eyes are where my mouth is. <laughs> you need to change the uh, viewpoint height. I don't know why it's so sweet. And when I added heels to my avatar, it made me taller. Yeah. But like, I adjusted the view height. Because so, when you do it, there's like a little ball in Unity that you see. And you're supposed to stick that ball more or less at, like in line with your eyes. So it's the same height. But when I do that, this avatar with heels, it's like broken. It's like too low. So I actually have to put the ball like way up high to actually line up right. I don't know why it's annoying. Winter Worlds saved, and one of them is fantasy themed. Well, howdy. I don't know if any of our mods who do emote are here right now. I know Turo does emotes, Bibardo started doing emotes. Um, who else is on the like emote crew? I think there's like at least one other person. try and be like a super perfectionist snob on because like this is a really good looking world but it also looks pretty terrible like look at the boundary between the water and the like ground it just looks very 
video gamey. And the like textures for the dirt aren't very good. It's just really hard to do nature. One of the good things about my basement map is I actually picked a relatively easy thing to reproduce with high detail and have it be very believable. Having an unfinished basement, like drywall textures, some wood textures, concrete, and even my concrete can be better to be honest. Before I think I've seen that on like Acton stream. It's Homer dancing seductively. <laughs> With his like legs spread wide. go back to my old avatar after being able to just sit here and have my face just pull natural like I don't know I can't do it I'm in darkness I am evil I am easy oh he like changed me yeah my tongue likes to pop out Stop talking to me. That's uncomfortable and I want to adjust it. My eyes freak out.
Can you come pick up from the side as well? I can like snare my like or, like snarl. It actually, it actually attracts, like, rolling your tongue. There's also, you can add a parameter. Do you know how you can, like, fold your tongue? The face tracker has a parameter for that. I don't think it's being used on this avatar in the animation layers. I could make it so I could like roll my tongue if I wanted to. Not exactly the most used part of visual tracking, which is probably why they didn't implement it. But it's possible. To be honest, the, the tongue also clips through the teeth when I stick it out the side as well. I mean, it's not perfect. It's just better than anything else I've seen. I actually really like how the face tracking works on the annoying orange. It's so interesting because it is such a featureless face.
Oh, I'm sorry you don't like me anymore. I'm sorry I'm a dark man. It's so crazy though. That's kind of a great example though, just like raw face tracking. I do like how the free avatar you can actually like move their whole muzzle or whatever their nose. I can like move my whole nose. I can mean, I have giant eyes in this avatar. Hey, me <laughs> the mouth. The good place. Uh, what is her name? Woof woof. Arf. Mark. Mars. Ruff ruff ruff. Arf. What is the name of that? The lady from the good place who like knows everything. She's like a construct. And she's like super powered. What is her name? It's like Carol or something. Hello. Hello. I'm just streaming to my little stream. My little viewers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. I gotcha. Have you seen The Good Place? Janet, that's her name, Janet. She has a wink that she does. She's like... It's like the least subtle wink in the world and I love it. So funny. I want to be a little Janet. An omnipotent god who's just there to help out. I'm gonna take care of you, little personal assistant. Your little, I'm like a genie. I want to be like a genie. Phenomenal cosmic powers, but I have a master who tells me what to do. Otherwise, I'm completely trapped and helpless. I go back and put the really controllers. <laughs> no, I have severe ADHD, that's all. Uh, is this... Is this... Your friends? It's the manifestation of the voices in my head. 
Oh, cool, you're schizo. I don't have that power. But I'm sure it's... Uh, they're just good. Oh my. Are you nice my friends? Yeah, I, 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 I yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah, uh, 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 sure you do. Me. Say hello. Hello. Oh my God. Wow. That's oh God. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh. Do you love knives? Uh huh. They're so sharp. I'm so glad you can show your expressions like that. Yeah? You're scaring me. I'm What's that even made out of? I don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. I think I know. It's ah, relaxing. Ah, oh, oh. It's relaxing. <laughs> Relaxed. Can't go further. <laughs> relaxed? I'm never relaxed. Let's be honest. I should make a, a toggle to make all my sweat splatters turn red. It looks like blood. all the parameters for the face tracking it just toggles to the full range but makes it so you can do this i look absolutely oh my god <laughs> you look uh a little wild yeah you do you do mm-hmm an entire year wow maybe in your little utah as well I'm doing well. crazy level. Focus 3, the Vive Focus 3. I wish it had base station tracking. Because it does not. It is inside out tracking, so you cannot use it in tandem with full body. But if you could do the Focus 3 with um, Lighthouse tracking, I would probably say that's the best headset you can get for your money right now. Because you can actually buy IM face tracking for the Focus 3. It's weird though, because the um it's it's not on their normal website. If you go to like Vive and you go to their website, like HTC Vive, and you look through their products, you won't see the um IM face tracking for the um Vive Focus 3. But if you click on business 
when you get to their business website, then they have the options for those. Kind of done. The face tracker is only $100, but the eye tracking module is like, I think, $250, so it is kind of expensive. It looks like it's about that time, though. I think Rumpet starts early, so he might not even, I don't know if he does bear chat or not, on Mondays, let's go see. I nearly got an OG Rift, I ended up getting the Vive instead, the OG Vive. And since I got the OG Vive, I ended up sticking with HTC as I upgraded, which is why I got the Vive Pro I, which lets me do all this facial stuff, which is really cool. No, you're trapped in a terrible spot because I agree. Index may release something maybe soon. There's like no announcements, no release date. But it's definitely been long enough that they definitely should have something. But they don't. So it's like, is it worth waiting? I don't know. Maybe. Because I would recommend the Vive Pro I. There are two problems with it. One is, it's like always out of stock, so it's really hard to get your hands on it. And two, it's probably going to be dated really soon. There are a lot of VR headsets coming out with higher resolution. Technically, the um, Meta Quest 2 or whatever has a better resolution than the Index or the um, Vive Pro. some higher resolution headsets come out for PC at like reasonable prices. There was the um, Vive Pro 2 that came out and I was thinking about getting it but it has a narrower field of view vertically even though it has a wider field of view. Oh, there goes my stream, bye! <laughs> I'll see you guys. 